This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we are starting a four week run of listener choice movies. These fell into a poll on our Facebook group page which you can be a member of facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash cast. Now, over there, I occasionally throw out idea suggestions for you guys to vote on, and I gave full control over the Monday episodes to you guys, our four Monday episodes in the month of November 2023, and you guys selected unanimously Amicus Productions. So I picked four movies to go through. This is the first one uh, we're going to be doing From Beyond the Grave. This is from 1974. This one is technically the last kind of anthology portmanteau-style amicus release they had been on a run specifically at this point i think releasing in 71 72 73 like almost back to back from things like tears from the crypt um even i think asylum 71 so like they've been running through that but it all kicked off with dr terror's house of horror dr horror's house of terror dr terror's house of horror which is it's always a, a deeply confusing name because it doesn't actually take place in the house at all as it takes place on a train but let's like put that to the side because we're not covering that as part of this particular run of four however torture garden is one of those titles that will be covered over the next four episodes and that is one of those portmanteau style anthologies that amicus kind of became most famous for i mean they did stuff out with that and certainly run parallel to the success of AIP and more prominently in the UK Hammer who were you know dominating even by this stage Hammer Horror was the kind of go-to quintessential studio for horror. Amicus just plugged away at the side doing what it needed to do and uh, from Beyond the Grave the movie we'll be discussing on this episode kind of closing it out is the one where I think they get most of everything right and as a result of that it's the most fun overall and it also boasts a ridiculous cast. You have uh, Donald Pleasance here. You've got Peter Cushion, who kind of returns in the role he does in Doctor Terror's House of Horror as a kind of crypt keeper sort of character, as the linking element in the case of this one, the owner of an uh, antique store um, that people are frequenting to either purchase snidely and cheekily, or steal from directly, not understanding that the items that they may be taking are somehow linked to bad events, uh, foreshadowing, if you will, throughout the movie's runtime. So, I think it gets a lot of that right. Also, the runtime is slick. This one gets in and out with its four main stories and Lincoln story in under an hour and 45 minutes, which is a success when you see a lot of anthologies these days who might do four movies, but for some reason it's running about two hours which feels a bit long, you know, I think you can tell a kind of portmanteau style story in about 15 to 20 minutes. If if you're a good horror director, you've got a good script and like a good story, 20 minutes is usually kind of primo, 25 at a push, but that should be the bigger main event that you're building your movie around. So without me trying to rewrite how people make anthologies, me a lonely podcaster, who's not a filmmaker, and I want to stress that, everything I do on these shows is purely my opinion, uh, and should only be taken with a grain of salt. It's mostly there for entertainment purposes. But yeah, From Beyond the Grave is where we're starting. Um, this is the second time I'd seen this movie. So I'd seen it years and years and years ago. But I always remember having kind of fond memories, specifically about David Warner's role in this one. But he kind of almost plays a kind of quasi-Jack the Ripper in a kind of pre-Hellraiser sort of scenario. Um, 
and when I say pre-Hellraiser, I mean that the the idea of an object needing fed blood in order to resurrect something. I mean, right, come on, you've seen Hellraiser, you know where I'm going with that. So yeah, like, that's what we're going to be covering on this episode, and like I say, over the next three Mondays after this, you'll be getting another one of these as we uh, move into December, which will be our last month, obviously, recording for 2023, but it's also a month that is condensed down in terms of release. We will release our final episode of the year on Christmas Eve, and then we take two weeks off. So now that I put all that out there, let's get down to it, shall we? You are going to get a very short break. When we return after the trailer for the movie, we are going to discuss, with spoilers, so you're being forewarned, um, the movie From Beyond the Grave. I say with spoilers, this movie is 20 years, uh, sorry, as of next year, it will be 50 years old. So I kind of feel like you ain't seen it by now. That's on you, not on me. So ladies and gents, we'll be right back to discuss From Beyond the Grave right after this. This is where the temptations begin. Unlimited temptations. Can I help you at all? I'll tell you what, I'll give you 25 quid to get rid of it. It's a deal. Each concealing a horrendous nightmare that reaches out from the dark world that lies beyond the grave. Come in. Whoever you are, come in. <laughs> If you are looking for excitement, way beyond the normal. No. If you want to test your nerves beyond endurance, come beyond the mirror on the wall. No. Step beyond this door. To the room of no return. Experience the evil with no name. Stop! Steal yourself for the visitor in the night. Every step you take brings you nearer the clutching terror from beyond the grave. of those who had been sacrificed to it. And welcome back. So you just saw the trailer for From Beyond the Grave. So let me give you some details about this one. Notice the slick transition as I give you details from IMDb whilst looking at my computer and you will be dazzled with movie stills from the movie. This movie is directed by Kevin Connor based on the screenplay by Robin Clark, Raymond Christaloo and R. Chitwin Haynes. It stars Peter Cushing, Ian Bennon, Ian Carmichael, Dana Dores, Margaret Layton, Donald Pleasance, Nido Porter, David Warner, Ian Ogilvy, Leslie Ann Down, Jack Watson, Angela Pleasance, that's daughter of Donald Pleasance, Wendy Anut, uh, with Ben Howard, and there are some other people in here. Synopsis is listed on IMDb as an anthology of four short horror stories revolving around the mysterious antique shop owner and his antique pieces, each of which hides a deadly secret. 
So, um, we are introduced to Peter Cushion's character who uh, has a mysterious antique store that people seem interested in visiting to buy bizarre little antiquities. I kind of love how this is set up, if I'm honest. Um, Peter Cushion is returning in that role, like we mentioned before, from Dr. Terror's House of Horror, where he's playing essentially the... The, the, the crypt keeper sort of character here. Plenty of makeup on. He's got a, a right old English accent. Um, and the first story kicks off with David Warner coming in and haggling down the price of an antique sort of mirror which has a cursed past that we don't know of. Think Oculus but less time travel -y. Um The mirror is a proper antique and... Warner tricks poor Peter Cushion, poor, poor, poor Peter Cushion in this movie, into selling it for a lot less than its value, taking it home, and I, I kind of love this setup. He has some friends around, and they're all like, oh, this mirror should be in a museum, and someone's like, it's the sort of thing that, you know, you could use to contact the dead. Why don't we have a seance? And then everyone's like, seance time, um, as you do. Uh, they get right to it during the seance, the David Warner, who apparently has never done one before, but is smart enough to know how one works, uh, communes with the other side and is met with this ghastly old creepy dead figure, um, who then starts to essentially haunt his waking dreams by appearing in the mirror asking for blood. The reason I mentioned in the intro about Hellraiser is that there is that idea of Frank from Hellraiser kind of asking Julia for blood as a way to reanimate him. And that's essentially what the creature or character beyond the mirror is doing. And then David Warner basically becomes Jack the Ripper um, by going to the street and kind of convincing prostitutes or socialites to return back to his property while stabbing them vigorously. Uh, there's a point in the middle of this story which I absolutely love and it it goes to, I love David Warner, I think he's a phenomenal actor. One of my favourite roles is, you know, the, the all-consuming evil in um, Time Bandits, where, you know, he's like, he is evil. He, you know, he is like, the, he is the, the, the doctor death of everything. And he has that way of playing very charming, kind of middle to aristocratic British man. Uh, but on a flip side of that, that also being really sinister. And he's in full swing here, there's a, I think it's after the second death, where he's on his four-poster bed and he kind of opens the, the kind of curtain display there. And he's essentially, he's caked in blood. His house is caked in blood. And he's kind of he's kind of sitting there going, oh, this is kind of mad, isn't it? Um, and at that point, he's like, you know what? I'm going to smash this mirror and stop this craziness. Like two, two bodies deep already. Um, we get a bit more as the killings continue. Stories from essentially this person beyond the other side of the mirror. Um, telling him that, that every time he gets blood it's making him stronger, it's allowing him to kind of transcend beyond it. And if you've seen any sort of, if you've read any parable, short story, Grimm's fairy tale, any, if you've watched any horror short before, anything from Creepshow, uh, you'll kind of know where this is going. Eventually, Warner reanimates him enough that he can cross to the other side of the mirror. Um, and Warner wants to know what's beyond. And as a result of that, is, uh, is is killed and becomes trapped in said mirror. And then we get this great scene. Um, it kind of reminded me a little bit of a modern day classic ghost story um, where you see from the other side of the mirror time moving on, like the, the, the kind of the furniture, decor, the people all changing over time until ultimately another group of people are in front of this mirror again. Apparently you change everything but you never move the mirror or the spooky candle in front of it. Feels a bit weird, but, you know, we'll go with it. And what you get is this um, this great, essentially, recreation of the, the intro scene of the seance, where they say almost exactly the same dialogue, and they get ready to have a seance, and David Warner's spooky, death-like character appears on the other side of the mirror, beckoning to be released, and rinse and repeat. And that's the first one. It's, it is a ton of fun. It's really well casted. It's It's got a kind of Jack the Ripper feel, which I kind of love about it. Um, David Warner is phenomenal in it, having a ton of fun. Tune up a ton of scenery. But it's just, it's 
it's well timed, it's well placed, and it's well executed, and as a result, it kind of makes me, kind of makes me happy, if I'm honest. We then transition there to the next story, which sees a kind of well-to-do gentleman um, passing by the antique store and seeing a, a kind of military medal, which is of interest to him. And as he's walking away from that, he passes Donald Pleasant's character, a former soldier, a veteran, who is selling matches and laces. It's a different time, obviously. I can't see the connection of why you would... See. I, don't, I, I can see the matches bit, but I can't imagine anyone ever being outside going, oh my god, I've... I forgot my laces. I just... Weird. It's a weird thing. But um, this guy buys some laces off him, makes a connection. We go back to his house and find out that his home life is absolutely bloody miserable. He's trapped in a loveless Maris with a wife that bullies him. His son doesn't even seem to recognise that he exists. And the following day, um, he has another run-in with Donald Pleasant's former servant soldier and tells a little white lie, actually a big old white lie, where he claims that he also served. And Pleasant says, ah yes, I could tell, I could, I could, I, there was something about you, I could tell you were a man who'd served, I could, I could just see it in your face, I could see it in your posture, sir. Um, and as a result of this, <laughs> um, this guy's now trapped in a kind of, I need to prove I was a soldier. So he makes his way back to Peter Cushion and um, he tries to buy the medal and Cushion rightly says at this point here, listen, I don't know if I can sell you this medal because, you know, unless you've got the papers to say that you served and you lost your medal, I'd be giving you something that is, like, it's an accolade given to people for their distinguished honour and service, which really doesn't feel right to just be selling to any old Tom, Dick and Harry, which does make me wonder why it's in an antique store. You know, why would you be selling something that only a niche small market could ever buy, really? So, weird thing there. But anyway, when Cushion turns his back, this guy steals it. We're not liking him because he's a thief. Um, and he goes back and shows Pleasance his, his medal, which dutifully impresses Pleasance. Um, and, you know, he, he says, you know, you should come back to my home one day and have tea. And our main guy here is now in the position where he's like, you know what, this is a more, ex I have more respect and more excitement coming from my fake life I built with my friend Donald Pleasance than I do at home. Um, during this, he's introduced to Pleasance's real life daughter, who's a wee bit weird, um, and just very well read. And we start to see the formation of a plan here. We actually find that Pleasance's daughter practices black magic. She's um, involved with a little bit of voodoo, voodoo, um, where she um, is practicing the dark arts via creating these little clay dolls. Um, and over time, the idea is put forward that maybe we just get rid of your wife, who clearly doesn't respect, love you, or take care of your household or your clothing, sir. Look at your clothing. Um, if we did that, then what we could have is a situation where you can marry my lovely daughter. You'd be my son-in-law. It would be great. You're such a respectable, you know, former serving person. And it builds up to that. Essentially, they create a wax doll and um, kill off his uh, his wife, who dies. Um, and, of course, he comes back and finds his son in shock that his mother has died under mysterious circumstances. And is essentially married off to Donald Pleasance's daughter. But be careful what you ask for, because you might just get it. Um, in the final scene of this movie, they are standing over the cake, and Donald Pleasance's daughter is like, "Can I cut the? Can I cut it? Can I cut it?" And all Pleasance is like, "You should." And our new husband is all like, oh, like, "You should," and all the rest. And she cuts down through the groom character on top of the cake, which happens to be a little wax figure which kills off her new husband. And um, we get a scene where Pleasance turned around and basically says to the young lad that, um, you know, whenever someone's prayers are, are, are needing answered, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll return that even to a child, indicating that actually the kid may have wished death on his father all along, which was the impetus for this scene. And... End. This is the second one closed 
This one's maybe not as good as the first one, but I still really like it. Donald Pleasance is absolutely brilliant in this one. Um, this is, well, at this point, 74. We are, what, well, five years? Um, maybe, yeah, five years uh, from Halloween coming out and him essentially for there on being typecast in the role of uh, Loomis. Um, but also... This is kind of Donald Pleasant still relatively in his prime. You know what I mean? He's kind of on the back slide, but still in his prime, still flexing a little bit. It's a great performance. His daughter's really good in this as well. She has a kind of creepy look anyway, um, which works wonders for the performance. So yeah, it's a great short here as well. Which then turns us to our next one. And in our next one here, we have a guy who, uh, this one's called The Elemental. And he appears at Peter Cushion's um, store and sees a snuff box. And he's like, oh, I really want that snuff box. And when he opens it, there's a little price tag inside it. And it's a little bit too pricey for him. But the snuff box beside it is less pricey. So what he does is he swaps the, the costings around and then tells uh, Peter Cushion that he wants to buy. I don't want to buy that snuff box. Um, we got a little dry liner of... Um, uh, I hope you snuff it, or something along that line, you know, I kind of wink at the audience from Peter Cushion, who puts it through, clearly knowing that the price has been swapped, and also, not a great salesman, he can't sell him his stuffed alligator, um, and this guy's on the train, where he bumps into a very eccentric woman, um, who is wonderfully cast in this one by Margaret Leighton, who, um, <laughs> he performs this kind of, she's a, a kind of medium, Madame Orloff, um, kind of like Count Orloff, uh, and she tells him that he has an elemental on his shoulder, and this elemental is not like a sex pest or, or one of these things, but actually is is like the spirit of someone that wants to murder, and she's like, oh, I can see it in your shoulder, the presence and all the rest, and our, our main guy, he's like, knock it off, I don't want anything to do with this, so he goes home with his wife, um, and very quickly things start going a little bit weird. Once again, this reminds me, I wonder if... I wonder if Clyde Barker was a fan of these growing up. It must have been. Because there's a little bit of this reminds me of uh, Yatter and Jack a little bit from Books of Blood. Uh, basically, this element on his shoulder has changed his posture. So he's actually visibly sitting like there's something on his shoulder and his wife starts getting attacked particularly in her sleep where she's almost strangled to death and they decide that you know what we need to do we need to get we need to get madame orloff in here to to exercise the demon and um, this one's this short here has got more comedy about it although out of all of them it's probably got one of the darkest endings which kind of makes it work um, and it's up there amongst my favourites of the of the shorts in this one here. And actually up there amongst my favourites in the shorts of the entire Amicus productions of the kind of portmanteaus. Um, she performs this exorcism right, but it de pretty much destroys the house. Plates are flying off the wall, the TV's exploding. Um, cushions are being torn apart, there's feathers flying everywhere. And she really puts all of it into it and manages to get the demon off the guy and she's like oh dear lord oh, my work here's done it's going to cost you a lot of money and he's like oh brilliant and all the rest and Orloff leaves and we then cut to later on and they're you know in their house and everything's the best money they've ever spent and you know like we're, we're ready to kind of continue our relationship now that this spirit is gone and we can hear a creak upstairs and the wife's like oh maybe it's not gone and he goes upstairs and then he's knocked downstairs by an unseen force only to be met by his wife brandishing a poker um, and we realise that actually the spirit has jumped into her and she fucking clocks him to death with this poker and we get this great scene she walks towards the door at the end puts her hands on both sides of the door and just knocks it over like it was absolutely fucking nothing you know, down you go and she walks out and uh, it's kind of awesome. <laughs> like, like, I love it because it is very fun, it's very comedic. The comedic timing overall is excellent, but because of that, the ending is... It's not the gnarliest ending out of any of them, but it hits a lot heavier because of what you've seen before. So, little chef's kiss for that one. Ton 
of fun. So you get that there. Um, the last one is, it feels like the longest, and I, I like it as a close, but I do think it's the one that has the biggest budget, and it's the one that's kind of, maybe the most traditional of the, the kind of amicus ones here. We have a guy who buys a door, like a big elaborate door, um, from Peter Cushion, and he's like, oh yeah, it was from a, a, like an old house, an old stately house, and the room behind it was all blue and ornate, and um, he manages to buy this door, and he puts it up as a cupboard door in his room full of ancient war artifacts, it's like old-fashioned axes and spears and stuff, uh, and he studied, but basically is the door to a stationary cupboard, and you can kind of see where this is going straight away, um, over time he realises when he opens the door it takes him to this very ornate old blue room but the longer he spends in there the more he has a presence that there's something in another room adjacent coming towards him um, so he keeps keeps going in, going out, going in, going out um, and eventually finds the, the, the this kind of diary slash grimoire slash like book of the dead um by this kind of ancient, old-timey, like, satanic magician, um, who has somehow managed to create this door as a portal to the past, as a way for him to essentially consume souls and maybe, question mark, return to life, maybe. Um, and then we're kind of setting up things from there. You know, he appears, he kidnaps his girlfriend, takes her through... Our guy realises that actually if he starts breaking the door, it starts destroying the room. And like set, construction-wise, this is really, really, really well done. For every time he starts hitting the door, like a section of the room is pulled away. And construction-wise and set design, very, very, very smart. Actually holds up. Like the effects are really, really, really well done because they're all done practically. The you know, it's surprisingly well held up. Um... And obviously this kind of Satanist dude is uh, is still trying to get them, still trying to keep them there. And they managed to destroy the door. The reason I'm racing through it is that it, it, this is a longer segment for one that actually doesn't really have a lot happening in it. And they destroy the door on the other side, trap them in there. Kind of the only one with the nice ending, but I also feel it's because this guy has indicated that he may steal some money from the till. But we never see him steal money from the till. So, I get the feeling that had, like the, my interpretation is, had he stole money from the till, this wouldn't have had a happy ending because he possibly didn't. He doesn't die at the end of this one like everyone else does at the end of all the other shorts in this uh, anthology. But, um, meanwhile, while this, all this has been going on, we've had this Lincoln story of this thief who is constantly trying to get into the shop, but every time he goes, someone goes in before him, and he's like, oh, I'll just stand over here. Um, our thief eventually comes in at the end, in the epilogue, and he is kind of messing around with Peter Cushion, who has two old-fashioned musket pistols, and he gives them to the thief, who then draws them on Cushion, uh, and, you know, is going to rob him, and Cushion's like, you're not going to rob me, and he's like, just give me your money, give me your money, and Cushion starts walking menacingly, towards him and of course he shoots off the guns no damage throws the guns no damage falls backwards into a old kind of torture trap kind of tomb like coffin um like an iron mask sort of thing and um you know dies obviously and uh and cushion kind of knowingly starts speaking to the audience about his antiques and the wonder that if you just come in and check them out they're kind of awesome and everything's going to be cool um, as an anthology, this works, like, really, really well. It's the one, like I say, they've had... My issue with Amicus ones is my issue with a lot of anthologies. Even things like Creepshow, which I genuinely love, but I always feel like there's, like, one or two horror shorts in there that aren't maybe great, that are kind of elevated by the better quality of the other ones. In the case of this one here... My least favourite one is probably the last one to do with the door, but even that I really like, so... I think the quality overall, the pacing overall, and the delivery overall is actually really, really well done. The third story, the, El the elemental one, which has got a more kind of comedic tone and aspect about it, actually is perfectly placed to work in this one here, where I think in the past, some of the tonality 
of the anthologies that Amicus put out could be a little bit all over the place. Um, they could either be too serious in the moment where I actually need a bit of levity, or vice versa, levity would come in kind of back to back and you'd be like, I, I, should I be having this much campy fun with this? Um, I feel like they get that balance really, really well. Like I said before, the runtime is crisp on this one. Uh, even the ones that feel a tad longer than they should, particularly the Donald Pleasance one and the door one, actually don't feel that long overall. Um, they are a little bit longer, but not to the point where you ever feel lethargy kicking in because of the the, the elements of the story. So I think that in itself is really well done. It's handsomely cast. It's excellently scored. The dialogue is on point. Like I say, it's a bit of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Peter Cushing's having a ball. He's great in these roles. Um, got good old-fashioned theatre makeup on as well, which kind of adds to the, the performance. But just overall, it's, it's really, really, really well put together. Very little fat to cut off the meat here. And as a result, it kind of flows through. It feels like this being what it was their fifth or sixth one, which was kind of the closing out one. Um, you get the feeling that by this point, they've kind of done everything they needed to do with the kind of portmanteau short story format that they'd learned all the lessons, delivered it into a nice, neat, concise package and actually delivered it in a way which feels satisfying. It works really, really, really well. It's a ton of fun. I don't know if it's my favourite of the kind of the portmanteau style Amicus releases, but it's definitely up there. If it's not my favourite, it's maybe my second favourite. Um, I'm really interested to check out Torture Garden, which I've only ever seen once as well, to see how well that holds up. I've got fond memories of that as a teenager seeing that, so and that was a long time ago. So we'll see how that one holds up. But yeah, it's just a lot of fun. You're going to have a lot of fun with this one. It's definitely worth checking out again. It would have been great in October, actually. Um had I been thinking ahead it would have been great to cover that but if you're having those post Halloween blues then why not shove on from beyond the grave in terms of scores I give this a 4.5 out of 5 um, really really delivers one of the better ones not only from Amicus but one of the better ones overall I think it's just really 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 well done and that's all I've got to say about that so yeah there you go that ladies and gents was us doing a little bit of Amicus, as you guys have selected for every Monday episode in November 2023. We will be doing another one of these next Monday. Uh, the next episode to drop, though, on this feed will be my reviewing of The Beyond, which should have come out last month, but, like, I came back from Japan and didn't want to do anything, so we're lucky we got any content last month. So, yeah, The Beyond, our second of our Gates of Hell reviews, will be dropping on Thursdays. Keep your eyes peeled for that. If you're checking us out on YouTube, please hit a subscribe and a like on this video. Leave me a comment. When was the last time you checked it from Beyond the Grave? Do you have fond memories of it? Um, do you have a, a portmanteau horror amicus short that you prefer to? I really want to hear from you, so don't leave me hanging. And if you're checking us out on Spotify or on Anchor, uh, where you can check out video content as this podcast rolls out, there's always a question there. It's the same question I just asked here. So leave your comments there. And anywhere else that you're listening in audio format, please hit subscribe. That way you never miss any of the content that we're about to put out. A lot coming before the end of the year. But you also get access to the over 1,200 episodes of Podcasts Under the Stairs on that RSS feed. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much for checking out this episode. Wherever you are, what the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off. <laughs>